This is the Convene Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Convene Talk, where we discuss interesting stories that appear in our popular newsletter, News Junkie. My name is Magdalena Atanasova, Digital Media Editor of Convene. Michelle, take it away. Thanks, Maggie. I'm Michelle Russell, Editor-in-Chief. The story I chose appeared in News Junkie several times, actually. The most recent one was from NPR, and it was about a conference called Legal Week, which is a legal tech conference in New York City in late January. And there have been a number of stories about how women were harassed during this conference, not at the conference, during the conference. And today is International Women's Day. The first story we had in News Junkie, I I chose because I felt like we needed to kind of hammer home this point, which is that women, according to a study of a thousand North American business travelers, women feel less secure traveling than men do. And my big thing after that was, well, duh, that's like we we kind of know that. And this story reinforces that it's difficult for women to navigate travel by themselves and always be worried that they're going to be harassed or somehow not feel safe. What's interesting about this story to me is that these incidents of sexual harassment did not take place at the conference, on the show floor, or during sessions. All of them took place at the ancillary events. So, uh, you know, non-sanctioned receptions or off-site meeting or whatever, this is where all of these incidents took place. So my question is, I can imagine a meeting planner saying, like throwing up their hands and saying, well, how can I control what is happening among attendees during the conference that's not actually on our property or during the sessions or the programming? So I'm interested in hearing from everyone else what your thoughts are about this. I think you can probably publish a code of conduct that you say extends to all of the activities during the time everyone is gathering. But how do you enforce that? Because there's so much that goes on outside of the program itself. So, Barbara, I'm going to throw it over to you. Yeah, thank you. This is Barbara Palmer. I'm deputy editor. This story was really interesting because, I mean, interesting is kind of a weird word for it, but an interesting point about it was that the incident that kicked all this off, the perpetrator was not in any way affiliated with the event. He was there with somebody who was at the event, and it was in a bar that was not any anywhere near, I mean, it wasn't a conference activity. What I thought was interesting that happened is that it wasn't so much that people could have done anything about that. The conference organizers couldn't have prevented that, but that was such an extreme instance of violence towards women that it kicked off a lot of disclosure about what does go on at the conference and at conference events. And for me, one of the lessons is what it cost to not disclose. And I don't put that on women. I take that on how it's hard to disclose. So you you have to make it really easy to disclose. I know this story made me remember an event where some man grabbed me in an elevator. And I didn't even connect that to the fact that I was at an event. It was like after we'd gone out to dinner at an event, we were sharing an elevator. And it was just one of those things that you just kind of, I don't know, put out of your mind. But it never occurred to me in any universe that I could go to the organizer of this event and say, here's what happened last night. And so I just think it's just hard to disclose those things. And I think that what's happening 
with this kind of surge of people talking after the event is that maybe we'll make the path easier. Maybe just disclosing it, naming it, really taking action when it happens. I mean, people say there's no tolerance, but, you know, make it very clear that there's consequences that it's you can disclose and it will be treated sensitively and that there will be consequences. So if all the people that and all the women and men that it happens to would disclose it, maybe there would be a change. I agree. And I think there are some industries that are more ripe for this than others. So it seems like the tech industry has experienced this more than other sectors. Jen, what do you think about this? Barbara, I think that's such a good point that you brought up that, you know, often the reporting part of it really stops a lot of people from pursuing action. And that's actually echoing what someone I interviewed said last year. Her name is Paula Brantner. And I actually interviewed her about some similar instances that happened. There were some tech conferences last year, one of which was the Game Developers Conference. Another was a Bitcoin conference in Miami. And both had reports of very similar situations. Women getting roofied, getting assaulted. One woman had an air tag put in one of her, in her purse while she was out. And these were all, this all happened at off-site networking events, social gatherings. So when I interviewed Paula, she's an employment lawyer turned consultant on harassment prevention. She actually helps organizations kind of establish a framework for combating situations like these. And one of the areas that she focuses on is the reporting stage. And she says that's a bottleneck. Oftentimes people don't feel comfortable for whatever reason, you know, Maybe it's because the person is someone who's really active in the organization or in the industry and just, you know, doesn't want that kind of attention being brought on them. Or maybe just the the situation was just, you know, embarrassing to them and, you know, they just don't want to bring it to light. So she created this kind of anonymous way to report incidents. I believe it's through an app and We can link to this story. Can't recall. This is over a year ago, but it basically created a way for people to report these incidences anonymously and conveniently and easily. And she says that's made a big difference with a lot of the organizations that she consults with. And something else that she does that I think is really interesting that could kind of help these particular situations where, you know, inappropriate behavior is happening at non-sanctioned events at social gatherings is an allyship program. So this is something that she's worked with and a number of organizations and her space, she really tends to work with a lot of organizations in male dominated industries. So like science and tech, STEM, and having an allyship program, which basically asks attendees and other event goers to undergo some kind of allyship training. And that can look like bystander training. That could be simply just wearing a pin that shows your support for the LGBTQ community. Whatever it is, basically it creates kind of an army of allies that are kind of looking out for each other. And You know, I think if you're at a bar with a colleague and something like that happens and someone's been through that kind of training, they know, of course, they can't prevent it. We can't prevent these things from happening. There's crazy, awful people out there in the world, but they know how to, or they at least have some training and some some guidelines to reference back to and how to handle it when it happens. So I thought that was really interesting. So And my view of this kind of is, can we prevent these things from happening? No, but there are things that we can do to make people feel safer and offer tools so that people know that, you know, they can feel safe. I feel like Jen really covered all the solutions to this. I don't know if there's really anything to add. I don't think there's anything else planners can do beyond that, really. One interesting point that was brought up that is in planner's control is 
alcohol at sanctioned events. It was mentioned in this story. One of the women said that she doesn't think she's ever been at an industry event that didn't offer alcohol. And I see that as a huge problem within events for a number of reasons. A lot of people can't have alcohol for various medical reasons. A lot of people don't want to have alcohol for various reasons. And I feel like it creates a kind of party environment in something that should be professional. And that definitely puts women at risk of being treated in a way that isn't welcome. And just puts people in a dangerous situation if they do overindulge and are trying to get back to their hotel and could run into trouble. So that's a scary thing. And I think that should be limited. That's completely within planners control. And I think it should be kept to professional standards and not go into this, you know, club environment every single night. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I guess I love that point, because I think it is important. I think one of the ways this is done is to give people drink tickets. They get two, Mm -hmm. but then what's to prevent them? I mean, I guess then they can't go back to the bartender and say, I want to order something because it's not a cash bar or whatever. They have to present a ticket. So that's one way to control it. I do agree. It's part of like the whole kind of gray area of networking where it has the potential to get into an area that makes things less than professional. Right. This is Kurt Wagner, digital editor, and it sounds like, at least in this story, that one of the other people, or maybe more than one of the other people who was with the woman, sort of followed their bystander training correctly in in trying to diffuse it and and have the offender step away. But then the guy, didn't the guy draw a knife on him? Yes. So, you know, this is kind of an extreme version of it. And, you know, the guy was fired eventually from his job, which is good. So I think that his employer handled that correctly. But, yeah, it's very hard to figure out how the conference, what the conference can do if he's not even going to the conference. So, yeah. And I think that is good to surround yourself with people who have your back, right, who watch out for you. I think that's just like a nice human thing to think about. I also think that For years, this is what women did for each other. They would say in the workplace, just watch out for that guy. Don't ever get yourself alone with him or whatever, just like the sisterhood, right? So it's good to have that kind of support. I think that this is a particular problem for like Comic Cons and those kinds of events where people are dressed up and there's just sort of this idea that because they're wearing a costume or something that may be provocative, that that means that they're looking for a certain kind of attention or activity. So I think at those events, there's a very clear harassment policy and they take those things very seriously. But again, you have to feel comfortable enough to complain. You have to have the channels where your complaint is taken seriously and you have to know that you're not going to be in a corporate environment. You're not gonna be penalized. There's not gonna be any retribution. This is from personal experience, but maybe there could be some kind of training or just a heads up to men in the organization that, hey, it's different for women. You know, because something that happened with Jen and Barbara and I, when we were in Columbus, we were walking at night to go to a restaurant. And, you know, Jen was watching some people across the street who were kind of loud very closely. And I was like, oh, you know, they're not going to do anything. Don't be worried. (laughs) And, you know, because I was like, you know, yeah, they're loud, but who cares? And she pointed out, well, it's a little different for for us. (laughs) You know, we, we, we have to be worried about this kind of thing. And she's right. You know, I mean, I should be too, I guess. But I think that sometimes men don't even think about that. You know, men who are good, upstanding guys who aren't going to harass anyone, but maybe will be good allies and helpful, don't even think about that kind of thing. You are a great ally, Kurt. And I (laughs) I appreciated you and your six foot six frame. Because (laughs) let me tell you, as, as a woman who frequently travels solo, I think I've traveled to 40 countries now, most of which were by myself, and I still will. 
nothing really bad has ever happened to me, but I do think like hyper vigilance is never f- like it's it's ne- and this is also probably getting a little personal, but like this is where my anxiety serves me and has served me very well because I think and I don't know if that's a learned thing because you know I you just have to be like as women and I'm five foot five like no upper body strength so you kind of gotta like. <laughs> <laughs> have your eyes around you but yeah having men who understand that like you do like is a huge 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 benefit because I do think if there's a creeper like that if there's someone who's just looking to do something like that and that there's another large male around I think the chances are good they're not going to try something or at least better maybe not in this case you know this guy was obviously insane and pulled a knife and it sounded like there were other men present but I think it does tend to scare off a lot of would-be assailants, you know, attackers. So, but yeah, that's at least just the world we live in. I truly don't think there's anything planners can do to prevent that specific kind of situation. Like, no, that's that's nobody's fault but the but the attacker. And yeah, there are things I've taught my daughters when they travel by themselves. Like, if you get on an elevator with a man alone there's just the two of you i always say just get off at a different floor don't get off at your floor (laughs) just get off at a different floor because the last thing you want is somebody getting off and following you to your room maybe like you said it's a learned behavior but i do think there's something about trusting your gut and your instinct and i think that's something that women have to do they have to feel like they have to be hyper vigilant like you said because Mm -hmm. you know you just have to protect yourself unfortunately that's just the way it is. That is interesting that you bring up kind of the difference between strangers and people you know, because there's this implied safety that With this guy was know. a friend of a friend. Yeah. And oh, I, think true. That, yeah. I think that that is really true that I think I wouldn't know the figures, but the people that are most likely to assault others are not strangers. Right. It's people that you know or are acquainted with. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, that just kind of makes makes it more difficult in that convivial environment. Well, hey, you're part of my tribe because right. you're at this conference. So you might let your guard down a little bit. But I do think that just being diligent and vigilant about having those policies, that sends a message. And if every organization did that and made it part of the registration, made it part of maybe have a visible place at the conference where people could go and and report or talk, I think that that makes it stronger, more likely to that people feel safe and are safe. Mm-hmm. And that's what Paula does. She actually at some of her events that she consults on, she'll actually be on site Mm -hmm. um, and be there if if a situation arises. So she can actually in person handle that. So I think that's quite interesting. There's definitely different ways of handling that. And she, it sounds like she really does customize it according to the group that she works with. I've actually reached out to her to chat with her a little bit more on this topic. So I'm interested to see if there's other ways and more ideas that she has since we last chatted a year ago. I like the part of the story. Didn't it say in there that it sort of raised conversation? Like there was more conversation. Other people spoke up about, you know, this happened or, or, you know, this was my experience or things like that. I think that's a good thing, too, because then, you know, the more people talk about it, the more likely others will feel would feel comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Like the Me Too effect. Like, I think, yeah, more and more people. Oh, okay, this isn't something. I'm alone with. It's something I can I can share and there's power in numbers and yeah. So Maggie, I have a quick question. Is this cultural or is this extend across all different cultures mm-hmm. and countries and unfortunately it's not culture, it's everywhere. The quote from the article, there was a woman that said out of 29 women, 20 had personal stories of inappropriate behavior at conferences. And I was thinking have I ever had 
And it, uh, yeah, of course, I had inappropriate behavior from men. You know, it might not have been that bad, like in the case of the of the article. But I've had you know men come up, and exactly because they knew me, because you know we are we've seen each other so many times at the industry events. And again, a warning to our listeners: it happens in our industry events as well, in the business events industry. So it's not something that happens in tech and law and whatever. It happens everywhere. Speaking of having a man next to you so that you kind of feel protected, I've actually had a case where a gentleman offered to escort me to my hotel to protect me. And I was thinking, is this really the case? (laughs) And it was the case. I mean, he was a gentleman, but I was very aware that that might not be the case. And I was so uncomfortable with this whole situation, especially as being back then younger in the industry, you know, and having this person who is high standing in his position for many years in the industry, making this offer and all my red flags went on. And again, nothing happened. He really just wanted to make sure I got to my hotel room safe, but... There was I think a quote that in... speaks to Barbara's point about trusting, like trust, yeah. you trust, you, you know, how do you trust someone? Because it's, how? It, yeah. it makes it very difficult and challenging. A person in the article said, you literally cannot win. So whatever you do, <laughs> there's always a case in which you, you won't win. And that's very sad, especially speaking about this on Women's Day having so many women experience that. And of course, it's not only women. Again, in this case, there was a man that actually raised the issue, the the one that got attacked with the knife. And I hope that event planners are not freaking out for yet another thing to think about (laughs) because they have a lot on their plates. And I mean, you can do whatever you can do. I think a link into the to Jen's story with Paula and having a further conversation with her on the podcast will be beneficial to just hear other options of what planners can do. Mm. Well, thank you for this conversation and for our listeners. Don't forget to support us by subscribing or dropping us a nice email saying how much you love the podcast. Anything helps. And until next time.